So hello everyone, my name is Salome Dea Prima. I am the IGL Liaison for Women in Natural Relations. And I'm so, so excited to host this panel on climate change. As climate change is one of our greatest challenges um, that we face, and it requires international cooperation and coordination to mitigate implications of rising temperatures. Understanding the causes of climate change, as well as both the gendered and overall impacts to our communities is imperative. Today, we are joined by three women who have all made a remarkable contribution to the fight against climate change. Brianna Furin, Stephanie Buchler, and Jennifer Tosca. Brianna Furin is an activist and environmental advocate for Samoa. Furin began her career in environmental activism at the age of 11, where she became a founding member of the 350 Samoa, a community that is focused on building awareness of climate change and working solutions, and a leader of the environmental group Future Rush. Since then, Furin has attended the Rio Plus 20 Summit, the UN Small Islands Developing States Conference, and the United Nations Climate Change Conference, where she has had opportunities to address policymakers at the conference. Furin has held a numerous um, climate change advocacy positions and was named the youngest recipient of the Pacific Region Commonwealth Youth Award winner at the age of 16 in 2015. She continues her work as the youth ambassador for as prep today while attending the University of Auckland. So thank you so much, um, Brianna, for being here. And I'll move on to Stephanie. Um, Stephanie Buchler is a research professor at the agriculture in agriculture science global at Penn State University. Her area of expertise includes gender and urban agriculture, renewable energy, and global environmental change in agriculture. At Penn State, Buchler works at the uh, works with gender equity and agricultural research and education program and the Globalizing Extension Innovation Network Initiative. Prior to joining Penn State, Buchler was a professor at the University of Arizona and a research scientist with the International Water Management Institute. Her career has driven her work in Latin America, South Asia, as well as the Southwestern and Northeastern regions of the US. Her research focuses on an examination of the adoption of climate change, and she is an expert on gender and climate change specifically. And then finally, um, gender, Jennifer Teleska is an associate professor of environmental justice in the Department of Social Science and Cultural Studies at Prost Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Her work takes on a critical approach to ocean studies and spans the interests of political ecology and the human animal relationship, politi politics of extinction, science and te technology and policymaking, environmental diplomacy, and ethnographies of international law and society. She conducts field work at the United Nations and in treaty bodies, diplomatic missions, and other sites scaled supranationally. Currently, Tleska is visiting um, researcher at the University of Bergen in Norway. There she contributes to a team to execute a large-scale cross-disciplinary project, island lives, ocean seas, sea level rise, and the maritime sovereignties in the Pacific. So, so that was so lengthy, but thank you guys for being here. And I guess not even the first question, but if there's anything you'd like to add to those bios, like please feel free to unmute. And if it's all good, then we can go, go to the questions, which I wanted to start off career-based because I feel like the, we have a kind of diverse array of interests here and I'm very curious on how you got there. So kind of what drove you to study climate change? Any particular order, or if it's okay, I'll go ahead. Yeah, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here, and thanks so much, Maya, for the invitation. I really appreciate it. So um, I started off in the nonprofit world, and I um, worked in um, Bolivia and also in Honduras in Central America um, with low-income communities. And I began to see how water really um, became a scarcer and scarcer commodity, uh, not only because of drought, which was an issue, but also because of intersectional issues of social class and gender and age, because it was women and children who then had to pick up the work and go collect the water um, from sometimes far off and also bring their laundry to far off um, wealthier communities. Um, in uh, Tegucigalpa, the capital city of Honduras, um, and in Bolivia, in La Paz, Bolivia, the capital city of that country. 
And it was also children who had to take off from school to line up for the water tankers when they were no longer being supplied with water because the wealthier residents of the city were being supplied with the scarcer and scarcer commodity of water. And they, um, in these poorer communities, had to pay more than their uh, richer urban counterparts um, for very bad quality water. So then after that, I um, did my uh, you know, education. I got a um, master's, uh, master's in public affairs at Cornell University and then a PhD in sociology at the Binghamton University um, and looked at issues of access to water um, in Mexico um, for my PhD and where I also began to see that it was not only um, issues of geography, like where you were situated along a uh, system of canals, whether you got water for irrigation, but also who you were. So if you were a widow, for example, a widowed woman, you didn't have the same access to power um, in uh, like you couldn't take the um, ditch rider who was the um, canal operator to a bar and um, in that way, I um, ingratiate yourself with him. That was not socially acceptable. So um, you didn't have the same access to um, getting that scarce water delivered to you when you needed it, um, like men did. Um, but it was also where you were if you were at the tail end of the uh, system of canals, that community actually used urban wastewater running in the river because they did not get any water. It was all used up upstream in the canal system. Um, so, and then I um, began to look at children's work also in agriculture. Um, and I was funded by um, an applied research institute, the International Water Management Institute. I uh, will recognize it. It's um, basically the headquarters is uh, in Sri Lanka. And um, I then was hired as a postdoc with the same institute um, and worked in India looking now at more closely at people who made use of a scarce resource water, but it was water that had been once used in cities. It was urban wastewater that flowed in the river and then was used by people for urban agriculture, peri-urban agriculture, and further downstream rural agriculture. And I began looking at the gender dynamics of who was using this degraded, but still, very coveted resource of urban wastewater. And I looked at it by gender, by age, um, by caste, because that was an important um, factor, and also by location, urban, peri-urban, rural, and by crop. Um, so it was women who grew vegetables for sale in the markets. Um, and then um, I wanted to give voice to the people in a way that academic kind of writing couldn't. And so I um, actually uh, collaborated with my colleagues um, who were my research assistants to uh, make a documentary film. Um, and then um, I began to see um, also there the impact of climate because um, this was an area that um, had very um, you know, uh, temporary rains in the form of um, these rains that would come very seasonal rains. Um, and sometimes they were coming later, sometimes earlier, sometimes very strong rains that would flood the fields. Um, and so I began to see more and more the impact of climate change on their agriculture. Um, and then after that, I began working more on urban agriculture with first a nonprofit. And then um, with the University of Arizona, I became a professor and worked on these issues. Then on the border, I like working kind of in my own backyard in India. I lived there for four years, so I would constantly going back to the field, see what was changing over time in these communities. And um, when I was living in Tucson, Arizona, I was only one hour from Mexico. 
and Northern Mexico. So I would go back and forth and I had a Fulbright at one point. So I was there more frequently and looked um, now um, almost solely at gender and climate change issues. There, I looked at fruit production as well as livestock um, and especially dairy production and saw how people were changing over time what they were growing, how they were growing it, what water they were using. They were using even for kitchen gardens, water from their washing machines, for example. And um, also for the dairy production, um, for cheese, we don't really think of it as um, something that is affected by climate change when you make cheese, but those are live cultures that can die with extreme temperatures in the cheese. So what women were doing was they were sharing the cultures. Maybe if theirs died, then their mother-in-law would have it. They would heat and cool the spaces now where they were making the cheese, but also to preserve the cheese until it was sold. They had to now freeze it. Um, and so they were using more energy. And so they asked for solar panels, but unfortunately the government didn't provide them with solar panels. They only said, no, those are just for the people without access to the electricity network, not realizing that they could help people in an unusual way. Yes, maybe, but that that was the processing of these um, agricultural commodities was very much part of women's sphere, and it was a very important part of agriculture, um, not just the production of the crops or the production of dairy, but also the processing. Um, so um, I began to look um, more at policy issues. And um, in my work, I have incorporated stakeholder meetings as well as uh, policy briefs to try to reach a wider public and to try to change kind of opinion. Finally, um, I um, have um, worked um, in uh, the US um, in Tucson, Arizona, looking at women, uh, for example, refugee women and what a difference it made to have access to urban plots and community gardens under COVID, for example. Um, and uh, realized that it wasn't just the food that they were getting, it was also the social networks that this was enabling, even despite COVID. They were still able to go to the gardens and see their fellow migrants, uh, but also um, other populations who could guide them in how to access other resources during COVID and during a time of high unemployment and insecurity. Um, and then also here, now I'm looking at um, the combination of kind of looking at agriculture and um, access to renewable energy for agriculture and looking at women's roles in that. Uh, I'm about to embark on a new adventure tomorrow. I'm going to Mendoza, Argentina to look at displacement. So what is climate change doing for low-income populations? It's also, um, meaning that they have to sometimes be relocated. And so this is a large scale relocation, one of the largest in the country that was done in 2019, moving people from riverbanks and moving them to different neighborhoods in this uh, urban and rural areas. But they were practicing urban agriculture there on the riverbanks that were now increasingly flooding, yes, but they had extensive land that they had for growing crops and having livestock. Now they don't have access to that and they're having to make do with more reduced or smaller spaces. Um, and so I'm looking at also the gender dynamics of that. So I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was such an interesting way that you were involved with studying of climate change and all these facets I don't think that are generally considered, but I would also love to hear from Jennifer and Brianna where you guys have found your interest and passion. Go ahead, Brianna, you can go first. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I got into climate work very young, so before I even knew that it was a study, I just knew it as this thing that was happening to my community. Um, and so I think I first learned about it in primary school, which is when it was still quite new. 
um, to us. And a lot of our textbooks were very old and it, they had global warming, which is like a big topic in science. Um, and then I was lucky as I was coming in, there was like newer um, studies coming in for our primary school and we were discussing climate change, particularly what that meant for Pacific Islands. And so that really um, lit a fire in me because I just, I just felt like it was our responsibility to not just stand by and let this happen to, to us. And so for context, I'm from an island called Samoa um, and our population is around um, 190,000 and that's across various islands. And the island I grew up on in Upolu, um, for like size context, it could take you only an hour to get from one side of the island to the other. And so it's, it's very small. You can um, drive around the whole island in a day or less than a day. And so growing up in like this small community, um, we knew that as an island, we would feel the brunt of climate change. And so that really motivated me to get into climate activism and then pushed me into the policy space to see how as our small governments going into spaces like the UN can hold bigger countries accountable for the impact that they make in global emissions and how we really need to reframe our minds around loss and damage, around impact, around who's causing this because a lot of the time it's seen as climate aid and charity that's given to the islands to adapt to climate change when really it's climate debt. And so there was this, this importance around wording, around policy, around how we can fight for ourselves in the climate space, which is why I wanted to, to study international relations and politics, which is what I studied. Um, and we just need more Pacific people for every Pacific negotiator in these um, roundtables, in these um, political spaces, there's 30 fossil fuel lobbyists. So we are, are largely outnumbered. Um, we have so many negotiators who run between, between negotiation rooms who are trying to cover all the fields, but it, it's very hard. And so that's why I wanted to get into this space because more people are needed here. It, it, you know, it's it's kind of humbling to go third, I guess. Um, but I want to uh, certainly thank you all and just also comment on how impressive it is that this is an event that's uh, student organized and student led. So I really appreciate that. Um, so, uh, you know, even though I can't see who's in the audience on Zoom, but I'm imagining uh, being with my students uh, and just reminding you all that it's okay to not know what you wanna do yet. Um, and I'm just speaking from personal experience, which is to say when I graduated undergrad, I had no idea what I wanted to do, except I wanted to learn a language. Um, and I spent my twenties traveling back and forth between the US and Latin America. And actually I spent quite a bit of time uh, in Bolivia um, and I was working with a self-managed women's collective at the time, figuring out how they might be able to use some of their um, artists and crafts um, and just bringing them to the States and kind of um, figuring out how to open up markets um, for them. And that led me to a graduate uh, degree in anthropology. Um, and uh, when I was, uh, so I have a master's in anthropology uh, and then I switched uh, programs to study law and society. So I have a master's in law and society and now a PhD in media culture and communication. So, um, and I should say too, that when it was time for me to figure out the dissertation topic, it was at the time of the Copenhagen climate change talks. And I remember, literally sitting horizontal on my bed for about three weeks, staring at the ceiling, because I felt pressure uh, to decide a dissertation topic, otherwise I was gonna run out of funding. And I remember thinking, there's a preoccupation here, at least in Copenhagen, um, it's changed over the last decade or so of um, a preoccupation with land. Uh, and very little at the time was focused on the uh, on the ocean. 
Um, and so that led me uh, into a project. Um, so I published a book uh, in 2020 about um, what it means for an institution um, formerly part of the UN system managing uh, sea creatures uh, on the high seas, including most famously Atlantic bluefin tuna, which is the most expensive fish money can buy. Um, and, uh, and then that project actually um, has brought me now into my current one. And this is, you know, so there's interest. So it's great to have, you know, Stephanie has some background in Bolivia as well, but also Brianna, I'm so delighted to meet you because um, I'm here in Norway working um, with a group of anthropologists, um, climate scientists. Um, I actually just had uh, dinner last night with a climate scientist from Fiji. Um, and the whole project is trying to understand um, uh, how to um, manage rising, how to manage sovereignty in light of rising seas. Uh, and this really brings me to my next project, uh, which will be looking at um, deep sea mining and bioprospecting um, in, the, in the deep sea. And I'm focusing on um, hydrothermal vents, which are considered the birthplace of life on earth. And yet these are sites that are the object of tremendous amount of extraction or at least interest in it. Um, and the kicker here really is that um, industry is using this, um, or at least the rhetoric is that mining uh, in the deep sea is uh, necessary to transition uh, to renewable energy. Um, and yet this is coming at the cost of uh, compromising the health of um, the ocean. And I'll just say um, briefly, because uh, I, I know you have many other questions to get to, that the way I see gender um, playing out often, um, repeatedly in my research is at the interface. So especially in UN spaces about the climate crisis or about the ocean, science is fundamental in order to get that work done. And, um, and this is a very male dominated space, not only um, by the people who um, populate the space, but also the very logic um, of it. And the other thing that I, I also see quite frequently, and this is one of the things that um, uh, I'm actually working on developing a, a paper about this, which is, you know, does diplomacy have a gender? And, um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is that it's not just about counting the number of women in the room, but it's also about understanding what are the solutions um, that are on offer that are themselves kind of, you know, have this legacy of the imperial colonial masculinist kind of logics. Um, and, and I'm very interested in unpacking and exposing so as to neutralize those power structures. Well, thank you so much. I, I find it so inspiring, especially, I don't know, as a university student. And I briefly mentioned before how I'm from North Carolina and uh, an issue that like I face locally is how DuPont uh, leaked Gen X into our waters for several years. And I just remember being so enraged that this just happened and there hasn't been really follow up on it and everything like that. And how do you, how do you even a singular person or someone who's made to feel small go against these larger institutions? And for you guys, it seems like the UN and other corporations kind of are that, is that like other that you have to face, you know, in trying to get these types of um, issues solved. And so that goes on to my like next frame of question are like, what are some difficulties you face as women in these, uh, the field of environmental studies? And do you think it has become more inclusive? I'll jump in. Um, yeah, so um, I was um, asked to uh, actually present on this recently at a conference in Mendoza organized by the um, irrigation department. And um, it was an international conference on water. And I was asked to reflect on my three decades of scholarship on water. 
and, um, and my participation in the water field. And um, I have um, you know, been met for many years looking at the interconnections between water and climate change and gender. And so, you know, one of the things that I noticed was that I came from a male dominated field, first of only looking at water, where I was often the only woman in the room and, and uh, certainly the only person looking at gender issues and intersectional issues um, with respect to water. And I've looked pretty much exclusively on, um, except for a little bit in the beginning, on um, water for agriculture and to a field of climate change, which actually, as Jennifer pointed out, is also male dominated. And um, so, and I think um, that Brianna would also say is dominated by um, more um, voices from the North. And um, so um, I was particularly, um, you know, sensitive to that having come from the gender and water field. Um, when I entered the climate change debates. And um, so um, what I did was I carved out, um, you know, groups of, you know, small groups where I would um, kind of train or mentor the next generation of, um, you know, young people who were usually from the countries that I was studying. And we would um, learn from each other. We would support one another. Um, and um, my edited book on gender and water and climate change um, was with a student who became a colleague, but um, who was originally a PhD student of mine. And we looked for examples from around the world of women who had been, you know, really marginalized, but um, who came from all sorts of different disciplines and different backgrounds in terms of many had worked with NGOs. And, um, and we formed kind of a community. And, and that, I think, um, uh, you know, helped me to feel less alone, um, but also feel like maybe I could make a difference for um, the next generation of women. Um, and I did the same thing in Mexico with the Mexican woman who came from a community not far from the communities that I was studying. And then I um, began collaborating with her in the field. And now I'm you know, so proud of her because she's um, continuing to look at gender issues and climate change um, and now also in urban centers as well. So, um, you know, I think that um, all of us need kind of um, to feel like we have a community. And if your institutions are not really providing you with that community, in fact, they're doing quite the reverse of not really valuing it, then you need to create one. And it's a little bit harder then because you don't have that ready-made community. There's, you can't take anything for granted. I guess I'll hop in in the same order. Um... Yes, definitely. Um, I will. I have the same thoughts around the space being very male dominated, um, as both Je Jennifer and Stephanie. And um, I think Mary Robinson, she always says it um, quite, she hits the, the nail on the head when she says that the climate space is too male, too pale, and too stale. Um, so too white, too old, and too male dominated. And, and that's not what we need, right? Um, and there was a stat that came out from the recent um, COP that the attendees of COP was around, there's an there's a even amount of male and female people attending. So you know that the world is there, people want to speak, people want to be a part of this process, but almost 80% of the speaking spots across the plenary, across the side events, even across the, the little um, workshops that happen alongside is by males. Um, if you go up to any panel, it's, it's all male. And so that's our huge issue. And then an issue on top of that, like Jennifer mentioned, is even when we have women in those seats, how what is the system like it's a still a very masculine system and it comes back to this this fundamental thing about masculinity and wanting to take over things and some of um the way it intersects back to some of the first colonization and the first white men that came to my islands 
is the way that they saw our land. Um, and even some of the first Hollywood films that was filmed in Samoa, based on Samoa, um, it follows this the same storyline. And I don't know, if it's a very old movie, but called Return to Paradise, um, based in Samoa about um, basically white uh, men coming to Samoa for the land and meeting the women. And it follows the same arc of meeting a Samoan woman, woman um, the daughter of the chief. So like the, the, the highest prize in the village, um, being able to take her away from her family and make her fall in love with him. And she was always younger. They always made sure she was younger, but the storyline of being able to take the woman, to take the topo, the, the chief's daughter was also, it paralleled the taking of the land. So once he won the girl, he won the land and then he could use the girl and use the land. And so it's this, this very like, it makes your skin crawl, this idea of, of ownership over women, ownership over bodies of, of females, but then also ownership over bodies of land, bodies of water, like being able to, to conquer and rule. And if we still have like even just tidbits of that same attitude in our in our systems and and think that things like, well, if we've, you know, taken too much of this resource, let's then now take out of this resource, which Jennifer was mentioning around, you know, deep sea mining, like, let's just keep taking and taking. And if we can't take from here, we'll take more of there. Like that attitude is not going to get us out of this problem. There, there needs to be a a complete shift in values, in, in train of thought, in the type of um, attitudes we have towards earth and towards women. And a lot of the times those two issues can really be seen as how we treat the women on earth and then how we treat mother earth. Thank you for that, Brianna. No, absolutely. I. Um... Uh, I, mean, I think we all share a very similar experience. I'm just pulling up um, on my phone here. I, um, I, uh, when you posed the question, um, Salome, I, I didn't think of this earlier, but it, it struck me, which is to say, there was an article in The Guardian a week ago Sunday with the headline, sexist snubs against female leaders are shockingly familiar. And it's a story about the way in which the European Commission president, Ursula van der Leyen, has been um, consistently treated um, as a woman, as, as, the, as the head of the European Commission. And so as much as you know, I, I receive that with tremendous frustration, at the same time, there is a part of me that also wonders, had Me Too not happened, would this article have even been published? And I think there's also something really important for us to think about, which is, I do think that there is at least um, in the popular imagination, in, in general discourse, there's at least an acknowledgement that this is real, um, that this is widespread. Um, and I, I actually, I was gonna put, um, I realize I can just put this uh, in the, there's two, um, I just watched this film last night. It's called uh, Picture the Scientist. It was actually, so the, um, the, um, uh, the Fijian climate scientist, she's, um, uh, so she uh, actually recommended this film to me. Uh, and it's it's worth watching in large part because it kind of references some, it's on Netflix, it references some of the, themes that we've just uh, spoken about. Um, and the other, um, uh, the other reference that I hope might help people is a book called All We Can Save, um, which is very much about, um, it's a feminist approach to the climate crisis. And it offers some very useful ways um, that kind of help us flip the narrative so that as Brianna mentioned, it's not just about mastery and control. It's not just about um, you know, extract and remove. That, um, and that, that the, the path forward must be about how we can heal the planet 
um, how we can revalue the planet and not just how we can treat it as commodity um, fit for our own consumption, right? Which is a very human centric way of, um, of understanding it. Thank you so much. So I wanted to go back to kind of Rihanna's point. You made a really nuanced point about language and how powerful language is, especially when talking about climate, but also gender. And you emphasize this point to the world leaders at COP26 about the importance of their war words. And I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that a little bit. Yes, um, the, the in policy, I'm sure everyone is familiar that like every single word counts because with every single word is a loophole. And so if you're not explicit with what you're trying to say, um, people can, can turn that around and in law and in policy, um, if there's no words to, to hold people accountable and to put measures into these, these things we're trying to implement, um, best believe that the, the government and, and people will find a way out of it. And I think, um, what is also important to mention is that there's so much gaslighting in the space and I and, and towards activists, towards women, towards communities. Um, but every time people who are, who are trying to, to save our planet say things, a lot of the times these systems and these industries say, oh, that's crazy. Like, mm, no, that's impossible. That can never happen. And it, and it happened with the push for 1.5 in the document um, for, for um, a long time, Pacific Islands were saying that if our temperatures rise beyond 1.5, we are going to drown. Our islands aren't going to exist. So please, we need to be putting this language. And it's just, it's just three characters in the document, one, a point, and five, but so important. It's, it's literally the, the survival of islands like mine. And a lot of, of the time, big governments, especially from the, the global north and industries and lobbyists were saying that's impossible and say that you guys are crazy to even think that that's gonna be in the document. Um, years later, so that happened in, in Paris in COP21. Years later, I was at COP last year and there were all these um, pins and these signs that said 1.5. So obviously it was possible, but they, they try and make you think that Oh, you asking for too much that's crazy and I think you know for a long time we thought that the world couldn't stop and then COVID happened and the world stopped and so I think it's important that we we think about languaging and we think about words and how they can actually be weaponized against us and the words that we do use can sometimes um that we can be made to seem like it's too ambitious or too much when it, it's actually just enough. Thank you so much. That's a, a fantastic point. And I, you bring up the idea that people are unwilling to make concessions if they, it doesn't have anything to do with their priorities. And clearly this is a priority for the small island nations, but also it should be for everyone else, despite the gaslighting that's going on. And I commend you for like bringing that forward, especially again, in light of all these significant um, hurdles. And I just wanna transition guys, cause I'm cognizant of the time and I appreciate you guys for being here. Um, what are the priority um, issues related to gender and climate? And um, I have some listed are land and resource accessibility, food security and sustainable agriculture, access to energy, water policies, and kind of what are the intersectionality between gender and these issues that you guys have seen in your work? Well, um, I would say geography matters a lot um, because, uh, you know, even sort of at the micro level, uh, you know, where you're residing will make a difference in terms of how you're treated by um, program and policymakers. Uh, so, you know, like the case that I'm studying in Mendoza, Argentina, um, those were very, very low income people who were living in, you know, what would be called shacks, um, you know, but for them, it was their home that they had made for themselves, um, some migrating from Bolivia and others from other parts of Argentina. 
and they had lived there for 60 years. Um, and so, um, you know, they had social networks there. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, with the melting of the glaciers, of course, there is going to be more um, flooding of riverbanks but also now they're in a drought. So the, you see already the extremes. Um, but I'm wondering whether if it had been a wealthy community located elsewhere, you know, maybe um, in a landslide prone area in the hills, right? Where often wealthy people live because you have a beautiful view of a city, right? Um, would they have been relocated or would there have been an attempt by the government to create a safer, um, you know, maybe safer, um, you know, uh, place for them to live in situ. And so I'm wondering with displacement, is it going to be by policy, um, not by necessity maybe, um, that people are relocated um, and, those who are relocated will be seen to be those who have less political power, less voice, right? Um, and so um, I'm going to sort of ponder those issues as I talk to people and um, think about, you know, this, um, it has certainly relevance for, uh, you know, island uh, nations, right, for relocation. Um, and this sort of issue of environmental displacement. Um, I'll stop here. I could say a lot more about other sort of intersectional factors, but um, I'll stop and yield the floor. <laughs> Maybe I'll let you go, Jennifer, because I, I was just sharing not long before Stephanie. Um, I think really, I, I'm not, really in a position to say um, what I would consider a priority. Um, I guess I'm, I'm also a bit struck by um, being in Norway the last few weeks um, and kind of dialing down to just everyday life um, and what it means to just do, you know, to create a work environment that, uh, enables families and children uh, and efforts of care um, to flourish, right? So, um, and I guess I'm, I'm coming off of having just read a report on, um, on uh, like, so thinking through, so I, I just read this UN report on, it's called like Beyond COVID-19, a feminist plan for sustainability and social justice. And they um, break down uh, uh, the area initiatives in terms of job care and climate. And the care issue is, um, is very powerful to me in the sense of not just child care, but also, also elder care and how that um, uh, more often than not uh, is, uh, becomes the burden of women in ways that inhibit our participation in actually creating the spaces and the future that we're talking about here um, and creating the spaces and the future that we want. And so I guess, um, you know, and also just thinking of what it, what it means to have, uh, you know, to have a, a domestic worker have paid sick leave, right? So that, you know, just kind of, you know, that there's, that we can think about um, that these, that climate crises actually just raise often everyday issues of just basic equity and justice down to something like, how am I gonna care for my parents when they get sick? And, and I know that the way my family is organized, it's likely gonna come to me. And, um, and it, you know, it's very gender-based, but um, I'm just sort of you know, thinking through the way in which that the issues that we're talking about aren't happening. So, you know, um, you know, Brianna, you, you, uh, you know, you offer us that this is happening like very much in your home, but, and, and it's happening uh, everywhere in our present, but I don't, I don't have to turn to the global South to see that there are also important initiatives um, that we can take here as well. 
in order to ensure the equitable participation of women in this space. Yeah, I would love to add on to that. And I, I completely agree with, with both um, views on, on this. And I think that because everything is so intersectional, it's hard to say like what will be the thing that helps all the other things because I feel like they all do. And I heard something this week actually that um, I've been holding on to it. And it's that all these, these systems that have been suffocating our world socially, environmentally, politically, economically, um, it, it's all being suffocated by the same cloth. And the cloth has been woven together by sexism, by racism, by white supremacy, um, by, by environmental crisis caused by corporations that again are linked to these things, sexism, racism, colonization. And it's all been woven together so tightly that it's suffocating us. But this thought can be overwhelming, but it's also important to remember that as long as we can pull on the thread that we know we are the strongest at pulling, it will slowly unravel this cloth. And so I think whatever we're doing is a priority to us because we think we can do it the best. So whether that's getting into gender justice work, whether that's getting into protecting our soil, protecting our ocean, whatever field you may be studying or whatever work you may be doing, just keep doing the work because we'll, we'll slowly start pulling those threads that will dismantle this whole thing. And I think um, that's how I wanna view it because sometimes I, I, I watch things on YouTube or I read a, a new article coming out and I think, oh my gosh, we're also in a soil crisis. We're in so many crises that I'm like, I wanna do like a million things at once, but I just want to remind myself just to keep doing the thing that I know I'm good at doing. Well, thank you guys so much for like these salient points. And again, not being bogged down by all these current crises 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 because and then that leads to apathy and then what do you have then if you don't have a base to mobilize and you know fight for these issues then and then people just let it happen and you can you said that's simply not an option and so now um blue jennifer that you wanted to show some slides and uh, um while i do that i'm going to move some things around so that we can have the q a section um let me know if you're able to share your screen Um, I believe you're muted currently. There we go. I'm just gonna run through, um, I just wanna share with you all, actually, so this was the film that I put um, in the chat, um, just to offer some resources for those of you that wanna continue the discussion beyond the panel um, and just some important points that come up um, in this. I'm happy to share actually this, uh, the PowerPoint like with you all if it helped. Um, and this is in particular, this is really the book that I really do want to share. Um, I don't know if any of you have um, come across this, but um, it's uh, one of the reasons why I find it um, very powerful. Um, it highlights some of the things that we just spoke about, right? So focusing on making change rather than being in charge, right? So what would a feminist approach um, mean? Right, healing systemic injustices rather than deepening them, um, appreciating heart-centered rather than head-centered leadership. And I think really building on Brianna's point um, earlier, um, like building communities, right, is central um, to what it is um, that we need. And then this is the, um, you can actually go on the UN, um, this is a really interesting, uh, or at least I found this uh, report um, quite good. And there's actually a, um, uh, I think it's on this Thursday, there's a, a public session with Mary Robinson and others, and it's open to the public. Um, so I would encourage you all um, uh, to, you know, just, just some of the things that I thought might help you all um, just to be on the, the panel for today. Thank you for sharing those resources. I personally have not heard of them um, and I'll definitely be looking into them after this. 
Um, if there are no further remarks currently, um, I'd love to go into the Q&A session. And the first question that I have, and I believe I'll take one um, that was sent uh, directly on Zoom and then um, the people in the room will be speaking, I believe. But the first question I have is, I believe for Brianna, and it's, could you further define climate debt? And do you think that the term climate debt makes Western states more uncomfortable than the term climate aid? Yes, definitely. So the term climate debt is really around this idea that because safe islands like mine, Samoa, we would contribute probably like 0, 0.00 something to global emissions. So we contribute so little, like just a speck on, on the map of, of what this is, what is causing this crisis. And so therefore, because we are impacted by this crisis, there is a debt owed to us because we didn't create it. So it's like you're living in a house and then someone comes and just takes a hammer and wrecks your house. And then maybe you accidentally tripped over something and broke a piece of wood. Like, you know, you only broke a little thing, but someone just destroyed your house. Therefore that person should be liable to fix it. But yet we still live in a world where um, that person would come and fix one wall and say, you're welcome, that was my gift to you. Um, and it's not just, it's not right. And so that's why this, this idea of, of climate debt instead of climate aid is what a lot of frontline communities believe the rewording should be. But like you've mentioned, um, it's very hard for people to admit. That's why loss and damage is a very like um, tricky topic for a lot of big governments because they don't want to be liable to give money to the things that they've destroyed. They just want to be able to donate money that they want to and not have to be liable to give the money that they actually owe people. Yes, thank you so much. Um, again, while I don't feel like those words are to me common sense, I believe it scares a lot of people um, and for a reason that you elucidated. And I believe now I'll turn to the room uh, if they would like to um, unmute and ask any questions in the audience. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Sejal, the other co-president. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. The first one that we have is, how have young women specifically been impacted by climate change? Uh, I'll, um... I'll give an example from uh, Uttarakhand, India, um, that is in Northeast India. And that is um, where uh, young women are the, among those who are in the communities because the men, uh, including their husbands who, um, you know, th these young women are married quite young and their husbands are already uh, migrants in cities and their fathers are also migrants in cities, their brothers as well. So they're there with their mothers and grandmothers. And uh, they um, are finding that their springs that they're deal, you know, that they get water from are drying up in some uh, circumstances, um, which are often made worse by projects, for example, like hydropower projects, run of the river, which is a little bit different where you don't flood an area, but you instead channel river water through these large pipes. But the problem is that it does dry up springs in the area where the water is abstracted. And also um, along the stretch of river where the water uh, no longer flows, then women uh, don't have water for irrigation. They don't have water for fodder, um, grow, you know, the grasses that grow for their livestock. So they have to go further afield now. Now, what women are doing is that they themselves are deciding that they really want to get educated. So they are, um, in many cases, getting a much higher, uh, you know, level of education than their mothers did. And so this is opening up some spaces for them. And uh, so I see a lot of hope among the young women. And, and in some cases, they're just saying no to their in-laws who they're 
uh, living with because it is a case where they go to live with their in-laws in, in those communities of their husbands. But they're saying, no, um, we don't want to only be in these communities. We want to go and, and live in some cases, even in areas where there are universities, uh, where there are high schools. And so I see that the young women are, their, their horizons are broadening. Um, and it is in part because they see the real struggles that their mothers and grandmothers have because of scarcer and scarcer resources due to climate change, especially water. I think actually, if, if I might jump in um, and also just acknowledge that I think young women like young men, like, um, like all young people um, are also experiencing finally acknowledged last week in the um, in the IPCC report about the tremendous anxiety that the climate crisis presents to us. And um, I think, uh, you know, and, and just the, the way in which the future feels tremendously precarious, even aside from what's going on um, politically, economically in the world around us. And so I just wanna like kind of hold space for that and, um, you know, also just encourage us to think through how we might not get swept away um, by the anxiety and to really push through it uh, so that it becomes a source to build um, solidarity, to build communities. Um, because I think really this is the challenge, um, the real challenge that we're all facing and that so that we can reach across and, and no matter no matter, and you know that we have to acknowledge our identities, but at the same time, um, push through them so that uh, we can build communities of solidarity. I, I think really that's that's what I see um, in, amongst the students that I'm working with. The it's the increase in anxiety, um, and and that uh, I, I hope I hope can be overcome. Yes, thank you so much. I, I completely agree with this idea of anxiety and what Code Red for Humanity really means and how we should take that, but transform into something that yields results, you know? Um, we have, if we have time for one more question, if that's okay, and I'm checking in with the in-person room to see if there's one there. If not, there's one in the Q&A. From the Zoom. Um, perfect. So our final question is, how has COVID-19 shaped the ongoing and new forms of climate change action? I think the, the silver lining is that it's become much more international. I think as the shared experience of COVID has brought the world in some ways together, uh, because of this shared lived experience, then I think that people are seeing the possibilities for acting together around climate change. And so I do um, find that there is some hope in that. Um, and I think that people are, um, you know, reaching out because also COVID has been a time of isolation. And so people are trying to connect in whatever way they can. Um, and so I think that this could mean uh, that um, there would be, you know, greater sort of global um, connections around that. The only thing is that some people's voices will be heard that way, and we can never forget that others will not be heard that way because of a lack of access to cell phones or the internet and computers. So we have to try to, um, uh, you know, try to sort of right that um, by um, increasing access, of course, to these, but also to make sure now with um, things opening up that we try to get those voices back into the room. Yes, um, I think 
like we shared, it, it def COVID has definitely told us the importance of, of collective care of in, in times of disaster, what really helps us is this feeling of, of being in it together and looking out for your neighbor and doing things that may inconvenience you, but will, will actually help someone else and being okay with, with that. And I think that the leaders who have really been able to keep this collective care strong that we've been seeing is, is, is female leaders. And I'm, I get to live in, so I'm based in New Zealand where I'm studying in Aotearoa and our um, female prime minister, Jacinda Ardern, um, was able to, to really look out for her country. And we have some of the lowest death rates of COVID in the, in the global North. And so um, just being able to acknowledge that and the fact that we're currently in an Omicron outbreak, but as a, as a leader, she managed to, to keep us so intact as a community in New Zealand. And she would say things like, we are a team of 5 million. And even though that seems big, we're still a team. And, and what that made New Zealanders and Kiwis think is that we have to look after each other, we have to protect each other. And so now is in the past two years, we're going through our worst outbreak while everyone's vaccinated and boosted. And what that means is that all of my friends that um, are had COVID, all of my family members that have COVID in, in New Zealand right now, none of them have gone to the hospital. And that that is a, a big privilege as opposed to the people who were in hospital at the beginning of this pandemic. And so really appreciating the female leadership that has come out of COVID and this collective care that has really saved a lot of our communities. You know, I, I do hope, um, I do hope both Brianna and Stephanie are right. And I say that in large part because um, some of the field work that I've done most recently as I've participated in um, the negotiations at UN headquarters for this new treaty for the high seas called bio, it's called the acronym is BBNJ. It's for biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And the very last conference um, that was supposed to crown potentially the release of this treaty was delayed now for two years um, because of COVID. Um, and they finally, so the meeting is, is going on um, right now uh, in New York. Um, and my understanding is that because, so just to kind of like give us also a sense of the knit and the grit of how international relations actually happens so inside the UN space, part of what has been going on is that because of the COVID restrictions, civil society groups, so Greenpeace, High Seas Alliance, other groups are calling on the Secretary General of the UN to say, you know what, um, New York City has lifted the mask mandate, so does the UN complex, because currently the, um, the meetings are withholding civil society actors from actually participating in some of the negotiations because of the COVID restrictions. So, um, you know, hopefully this will now lift, um, but I, I, there is some lament that um, COVID delayed the release of, um, and the potential uh, agreement uh, for this new uh, treaty for the high seas. So I'm, I'm hoping um, uh, at least within the year uh, 2022, we might finally uh, have that treaty in hand. Yes, thank you so much for hiding, highlighting the complexities of all like the actions that we face. Is it two, uh, one step forward, two steps back, but thinking of it more as like the overall progress towards something. And I really appreciate that, like what you guys have highlighted. Um, so I believe that's the end of our time. Unless there's any final remarks, I just want to thank you actually from the bottom of my heart because this has been such an enlightening panel because I think at times climate change has been used um, just like as an overarching topic and oh, like climate change is a big issue. Let's just talk about it. But I, I found very, um, very salient points from this like, um, panel that I think I'll bring back with me to my studies and just general interest. And I just want to thank you guys so much for being here. Um, so if there's any other topics you guys want to discuss or anything, I, I believe that's it. 
Thanks a lot for organizing us. I really appreciate it bringing us together. Yes, definitely. Thank you for having us. And also just on what Jennifer shared earlier about um, climate anxiety, I just wanted to share with everyone that these topics can be like very heavy and you could also walk away from this feeling like there's so much to do um, or that you haven't been doing enough. But I hope that everyone is that you're kind to yourself and forgive yourself for what you didn't know before this. Um, because now you know now and and just be be kind and feeling like you are a part of something bigger and, and you're supported and you have community out there. Yeah, and that this space is the making of a community. That's that's exactly the point, right? And so that's really why, uh, as I said earlier, like um, it's so encouraging to see that this is student led. So I, I, I it's it's that's super important to emphasize. You know, I'm an ambassador for Sisters on the Planet and Oxfam America Initiative. And um, the way I think about my involvement in that is not just the bigger events that I'm part of for that, but the daily practices that I have. So I um, take care to dry most of my clothes just by hanging them up. And the reason for me to do that is because I think about my other sisters on the planet and I want to have a livable future for them today and into the future. I also have a daughter and who's actually also now looking at negative climate emissions. And so she's, you know, carrying on that work. And so I think what one can do is to think like, what can I do in my personal life? And what can I do in my professional life to be a really good sister on the planet? And, and to be a good citizen too, right? To, to actively participate in the political process uh, to create the, the, the policies that we hope can also scale the change that we need. Yes, thank you guys so much for being here. And I hope you guys have either a good night or a good day, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much. Goodbye.